Yeah, so I'm, I'm here as, as all of you know, you know now, uh, because two years ago, my family learned a fundamental, very important lesson. Uh, and that lesson is that superheroes do not wear capes. Um, heroes, in fact, do like a biology. Um, in fact, well known to all of you, but recent to us. So, uh, yeah, I'm, I'm here because I'm the father of the, the first diagnosed patient, patient for a glycogen deficiency. Uh, and it's been an amazing two and a half year odyssey since then as we try to work with other families and other scientists to build a community uh, and, and support a scientific enterprise that can go ahead and understand and treat and cure this disorder. And, uh, you know, I, I gotta say that even though I think this is sort of focused on ML1, there's two factors here that we, th this story, um, not unique at all to us. I think this is a story that's gonna repeat again and again uh, because of two major changes going on. And those changes are exome sequencing and, of course, the, the internet. Um, it, I think this will happen over and over as a result of these. So if you look at just exome sequencing, in fact, there was, there was a brilliant slide by uh, Kevin Campbell on one of the Sunday satellite sessions where he showed, and this is a very crude approximation of Kevin's, Kevin's slide, the number of disease genes discovered over time for district-like myopathy, um, and there's a blue line in there that represents the introduction of exome sequencing, and it just explodes after the introduction of exome sequencing. So exome sequencing is unearth unearthing lots of new disorders, and through the internet and social media, Patients are connecting with each other, forming communities, and reaching directly out to scientists like you. And this will be happening over and over again on Biosearch. Um, and so this is the story of just one disorder, and in some ways uh, that, that begins with my son. I think this is a model going forward that will be repeated uh, over and over, over many thousands, I maybe mean, many hundreds of genes and perhaps thousands of disorders. Uh, and I also want to remind you that you know, when you're working with a patient's cells in, in a dish, where those cells actually came from. Uh, because in some sense, the reason those cells got to you is that Mother Nature is, is you know, the biggest scientist of all, and she's constantly making you know, knockouts, knock-ins, knock-downs, and what have you. And so it's important to remember sometimes the sacrifices that were made by these patients to get those cells to you, and what it's like to live with one of these disorders. And so for, for a long time, all the pictures you see here, these are when my son was undiagnosed, when we had no idea what was going on. Uh, and so i just like to remind all of you to, to it's important for us as a species to honor the sacrifice these children make by doing the best science we can with the cells that they're giving us and with the data that they're giving us. Um, so for four and a half years, we had no idea what was going on. And thanks to a groundbreaking study that, used to, uh, that was trying to measure the, the clinical efficacy of exome sequencing uh, for intractable diagnoses at Duke University, we got an answer uh, because they sequenced my son's version and what they found was they had two loss of function mutations, a friendship and a, and a premature stop, and it's by one gene. Uh, but this is sort of the, uh, you know, when they, when they figured this out, they realized that they didn't actually have necessarily an answer, uh, because there is no human disease associated with NY1. And so they had to answer the question, you know, what do you do with a hand of one? Are we really sure that we got this? And the reason that they were very confident was that people like you had done so much basic science in advance. So people like Tadashi had actually done a tremendous amount of work on NY1, and that work could be translated by a CDG expert like Hud to say that actually, <laughs> you, you know, that's on the internet, Hud. <laughs> Take it off. <laughs> yeah, so, so Duke reached out to Hud, they said, hey, can you interpret the literature for us and connect the dots? You know, if you were to see a patient that, that was lacking in NY1, what do you think they might look, at, look like? And when you connect the dots together, what you get is a portrait and so right off the bat, you know, we said, okay, well, or, well, Duke said, we're pretty sure we've got this. We think we, we understand what you've got here. Uh, and, and that was an amazing moment for us because we went from, you know, dozens of potential targets as to what our son could be suffering from immediately down to one. And we had a place where we could focus our energy. Uh, and the unusual thing is that people sometimes debate whether or not a genetic diagnosis like, like this is actionable at all. And I think the fact that we're here today says it's certainly very actionable. But I want to remind people of the long and proof, which is that, um, you know, when you, when you get the science right, you, even at, at the very least, it allowed me and my wife to expand our family. And this is why my son, my former old son, Winston, is here and happy and healthy today. Because people like you got the science right. And that's why it matters. Um, so, you know, when you're, when you're fighting a disease and you're the only patient in the world, we said, okay, well, we better do some science. So, literally within a few weeks of, of receiving the news from Duke, we headed out to Hud's lab in San Diego. We said, what do we do? Where do we go from here? And he said, well, let me take you to the top of your diagnostic journey, uh, the peak of that, of, of, of this mountain. So just having that information allowed us to sort of see the landscape of where we 
would have to go if we ultimately wanted understanding tree name care. And unfortunately, what we realized that is that we would have to climb uh, what we call Mount Lyco, um, which is an order of magnitude at the very least more difficult than getting to just a diagnosis. Uh, so that, that, the diagnosis was the easy part. And we realized that there is just absolutely no way that we could possibly do this alone. Uh, and we know from, from, if you look into the exome databases, you will find uh, estimates of the loss of function of genes. There should be around 1,700 patients worldwide, at least with the Bengali's deficiency. So we knew there were others. We just had to, to find them or give them a way to find us. And so what I did is I wrote a blog post that uh, we sort of showed like a beacon and make it very easy for other families or researchers that were looking for this condition to find us and find us they did. Because um, within a few days it was actually read by over a million people. And then with, within months um, we had patients showing up uh, all over the world in fact. So this happened very quickly. And then for us to, to, to finally have a community we're like going from this dark night of uncertainty to the sunlight of science for the very first time. This was a really dramatic um, moment for us to, to build this family and this community of other patients. And so to, you know, today we're, we're a community very united uh, with each other and with the scientists trying to figure out a way to understand, treat, and cure this disorder. At the moment, there's actually 20 patients because last week just two more showed up. So they literally are being found on almost a weekly basis now. And you can tell that the rate at which we're finding patients is accelerating over time. So I think we can have you know, hundreds of patients within Uh, you know, and then within just a year and a half, there was the first ever, first ever year and a half with discovery of the disorder, there was a patient, family, clinician, scientist uh, summit uh, at, at, at Sanford Burnham uh, where we sort of exchange ideas, get a sense of, okay, well, where do we go from here? What are, what are the priorities and uh, what don't we understand and what should we understand? Uh, in case you're wondering, Tadashi was who he was just hiding in the corner. <laughs> So we have shoved as many patients as we can get into. In fact, I think we'll end up shoving every living patient through this protocol in the span of about a year and a half, um, more than likely. And I can't really describe in words what it's like to, to have so much data collected in just five days. So I've got a picture of, of every hook, prop, procedure, or scan throughout the entire protocol. So this is all done in five days. And again, every picture here is a different procedure of some kind, some kind of data being collected. So it's an intense experience. But you get out of that at the end, you know, a lot of data. And when you aggregate that data across all the patients, what you start to get are biomarkers. So we're starting to have a very good understanding of what's going on with this disorder. We know that with NY1, several other mechanisms get dysregulated. And if we're looking for you know, targets for therapy, we can start to look, check to see if these are affected uh, well, by various compounds or other techniques. Uh, and I also think that what's interesting here is that because the, the community is so united, what I would call some, you know, community science. So we have a patient registry that, that's internal to the patients, and with this registry, we're, we're noticing some patterns. So I'll just share a few of those patterns with you, which I think are kind of interesting. So if you look at nature, and you look at these exome databases, and you look at the distribution of mutations and I want across the gene, they're more or less uniform. They sort of happen all over the place. But they're not at all uniform in the alleles amongst the patients. And in fact, if you look at, at the max of the locus between mother and father, um, they're in fact all clustered very tightly. And in fact, they're clustered right after the active site. So in, in 20 patients, we have yet to find a single patient that has, uh, that doesn't have real, at least one allele with what appears to be a preserved active site. So I think that's kind of interesting, especially like the fact that we can't find any residual activity. Uh, but it's gotta be there somewhere, because nature is telling us, I think it's there. So, uh, and there's more data on the patient side too. You know, so we also have uh, a way of, just to put through our, our own experience, it's still going to be by severity. So we, so we kind of predict now, based on which ability you have, roughly what the severity of the disorder is going to be. Uh, we also know, based on which alleles are involved, which medications are likely to work, uh, to work well for others. This you know, information we trade amongst each other as patients. Uh, and so I think that's why we're very excited to be, to be here and be working with people like, like HUD and Tadashi and Hamid, uh, because I think this, this is the new model, and this is how it's going to be for a lot of these ultra rare disorders this hand-in-hand -hand collaboration between patients and between scientists. Uh, and to all of you, I have, uh, I just want to sort of encourage you to keep going. We desperately need what you're doing. We need a lot more basic science in the area of like, biology if, uh, if we're going to really make a difference for these kids. Uh, and, and just, I'll leave, I'll leave you with this thought, which is that, you know, you may be the, the most basic
basic, of, of basic science is doing things that there's no way that you could be relevant to salvation after someday. But I guarantee you, there's someone out there somewhere waiting for you to be their hero. 